In this video, I will discuss what fascism would mean in the United States through the lens of Sinclair Lewis's 1935 novel, It Can't Happen Here. If you find this video entertaining, informative, or provocative in some way, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Instead of systematically or philosophically defining fascism, I'm going to situate American fascism in concrete and historic practices. When we consider the Nazis, or the Italian fascists, or the Ku Klux Klan, an organization many scholars identify as proto-fascist, what we find most in common is the concept of an essential nation or people that is eternal and transcendent and where membership is based on intrinsic characteristics. To Mussolini, the Italian people embodied the Roman Empire. Hitler said that only so-called Aryans could be members of the German nation. It didn't matter if someone was born in Germany, educated in Germany, spoke German, knew German history, or held German citizenship. If a person was not Aryan, if a person was, say, of Jewish ancestry, or Slavic ancestry, or Roma ancestry, he or she could not be German. Likewise, in the 1920s, a period where Ku Klux Klan membership numbered in the millions, the Klan said that only people of Western European ancestry could be American. It didn't matter if a person was a good citizen and worker. If he was from Eastern Europe or black or Asian, he could never truly be American. The American nation was the white race. As 1920s Imperial Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, Hiram Evans, put it, There are three great racial instincts. They are condensed into the Klan slogan, Native, White, Protestant Supremacy. He also wrote that, Racial integrity is a very definite thing to a Klansman. and means even more than good citizenship, for man may be in all ways a good citizen, and yet a poor American, unless he has racial understanding of Americanism. The races and stocks of men are as distinct as breeds of animals, and every boy knows that if one tries to train a bulldog to herd sheep, he has in the end neither a good bulldog nor a collie, although he might end up with an absolute cutie pie. When fascists conceptualize an essential people, they also conceptualize an outsider who threatens the very life of the nation. In other words, fascist politics is a politics of scapegoating, of nostalgia, of returning to some lost golden age, a politics that promises to make the nation great again. It says the people were once great, but something or someone's has reduced, diminished, diluted, polluted, corrupted it. For Mussolini, the scapegoats were materialists who placed science, reason, or class struggle above faith, idealism, feeling, and spirit. Namely, Italian fascism scapegoated liberals and socialists. For Hitler and the Nazis, the corruption was the Jews and the communists. For the Ku Klux Klan, it was blacks, immigrants, socialists, and race traders. So implicitly or explicitly, the fascist solution is always to rid the nation of scapegoats. Thus, fascist economics and politics is based on people rather than principle. Whether a policy is good or bad is based not on whether it follows some sort of rule of law or generalized ideal, but on whether it benefits the so-called people. For instance, is fascism pro or anti-welfare state? In Nazi Germany, it was the welfare state for Aryans, but death camps for Jews and other supposedly lesser races, the disabled, and political dissidents. For these reasons, fascists tend to scorn democracy, because democracy is all about compromise between conflicting groups. For fascists, there are only two groups, the nation and the threatening outsider. So fascism tends to organize around charismatic leaders who pledge to do what is necessary, even if it means abolishing democracy. There have always been fascist elements within American life, and indeed even periods where fascist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan were mainstream. One could even say that America's history of racist immigration restriction has quasi-fascist elements based on protecting the nation from some unassimilable outsider, beginning with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned the immigration of Chinese laborers, followed by the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907, which tried to restrict the immigration of Japanese laborers, followed by the 1924 Immigration Act, which banned immigration from Asia and Africa altogether, and greatly reduced immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. These immigration policies were based on the notion that these groups of people, i.e. the Chinese, Japanese, Eastern Europeans, could never fundamentally be American. And obviously these ideas, which very much reflect the Klan's notion of Americanism, were not fringe, considering that they culminated in comprehensive national laws. Laws which Hitler, by the way, greatly admired. Hitler would write that, What made the United States so dominant was that it strictly prescribed how a man must be constituted if he is to be admitted. Now we get to the novel, which describes an America where a fascist dictator by the name of Buzz Windrup comes to power during the Great Depression. So how does Sinclair Lewis envision this happening? One condition Lewis believed laid groundwork for fascism was anti-radicalism, particularly among the wealthy and middle classes. People who the narrator refers to as conservative manipulators of privilege, who damn as dangerous agitators any man who menaces their fortunes, who jump in their chairs at the sting of a gnat like socialist Eugene Debs, and blandly swallow a camel like Windrup. They hysterically attack this eternal enemy and call anyone left of center Bolshevik, 
or dangerous agitators who threaten the very life of the nation. The conservative manipulators of privilege are the kinds of people who, in the midst of mass unemployment and systemic depression, are most concerned with poor people, by which they mean the vast majority of Americans, being lazy moochers. As one middle-class woman in the novel would put it, here's 120 million people, with 95% of them only thinking of self, instead of turning to and helping the responsible businessmen to bring back prosperity. All these money grubbers, thinking only of how much wages they can extort out of their unfortunate employer, with all the responsibilities he has to bear. A powerful businessman in the novel would say, these are serious times, maybe 28 million on relief, and beginning to get ugly, thinking they've got a vested right now to be supported. Note that Sinclair Lewis wasn't just making stuff up. Just look at some of the things real people wrote to government officials and to Eleanor Roosevelt in the depths of the Great Depression. A woman from Columbus, Indiana wrote that, We have always had a shiftless, never-do-well class of people whose one and only aim in life is to live without work. There's never been any necessity for anyone who is able to work being on relief in this locality, but there have been many eating the bread of charity and they have lived better than ever before. As for the clearance of the real slums, it can't be done as long as their inhabitants are allowed to reproduce their kind. A letter writer who simply described himself as a taxpayer urged Secretary of Commerce Harry Hopkins to investigate relief agencies in cities because the cities are where there are a large foreign and Jewish population. He would say these cities are now on the verge of bankruptcy because we are feeding a lot of ignorant foreigners by giving them relief. He concludes by saying that the Communist Party is composed mostly by foreigners and Jews who urge the downfall of this government. In their feverish anti-radicalism, the conservative manipulators of privilege will willingly support a fascist so long as that fascist is anti-socialist, which all fascists are. As one young middle-class supporter of Windrip would say, he shoots off at his mouth a lot about how he'll jack up the income tax and grab the banks, but he won't. That's just molasses for the cockroaches. What he will do, and maybe only he can do it, is to protect us from the murdering, thieving, lying Bolsheviks that would, why they'd like to stick all of us that are going to the, on this picnic all the decent clean people that are accustomed to privacy and to hall bedrooms and make us cook our cabbage soup on a primus stuck on a bed. Yes, or maybe liquidate us entirely. No, sir. Berzelius Windrip is the fellow to balk the dirty sneaking Jew spies that pose as American liberals. Indeed, Plank 13 in Windrip's platform outlaws the advocating of communism, socialism, or anarchism with penalties of 20 years of hard labor up to death. Lewis also seems to believe anti-intellectualism promoted fascism, a condition evident in a country where several states tried to ban the teaching of evolution. As the narrator says, Remember when the Hick legislators in certain states, in obedience to William Jennings Bryan, who learned his biology from his pious old grandma, set up shop as scientific experts and made the whole world laugh itself sick by forbidding the teaching of evolution? Remember the Kentucky Knight Riders? Remember how trainloads of people have gone to enjoy lynchings? And once in power, Buzz Windrip purged the universities of all traces of intellectualism. In place of a curriculum of liberal arts and physical and biological sciences, the university under Windrip's fascist dictatorship was only concerned with practical and useful disciplines, such as mining engineering, foremanship, and the elements of production. And this anti-intellectualism extends to things like art, politics, and science, things they believe any millionaire could do just as well if they put their minds to it. Racism is perhaps the most important factor in Buzz Windrip's rise. Windrip appeals to anti-Semitism and the belief that the Jews were behind elitist and intellectualist institutions, as well as racism against blacks in the South and racist anxieties of northern workers who resented the great migration of blacks from the South to northern cities during World War I in the 1920s. Plank 10 in Windrip's platform prohibits all blacks from voting, holding public office, practicing law, medicine, or teaching in any class above the grade of grammar school. It also calls for blacks to be taxed 100% of all sums in excess of $10,000 per family per year, which they may earn or in any other manner receive. The narrator says that in practice this meant that all well-paying jobs and businesses held by Negroes will be grabbed by the poor white trash among Buzz's worshippers, and that instead of being denounced, they'll be universally praised as patriotic protectors of racial purity. So while Windrip will distribute wealth to white Americans, his agents, the Minutemen, will discriminate against and persecute Jews and African Americans. As the narrator puts it, every man is a king so long as he has someone to look down upon. In a sense, what Sinclair Lewis imagines a fascist doing is nationalizing racist policies and practices already widespread at the state and local levels. We all know that blacks in the South suffered from Jim Crow laws and systematic disenfranchisement. But in the North, blacks were relegated to the lowest paid and most dangerous jobs, and they were kept out of most neighborhoods through racial covenants which restricted the sale of houses to whites only. In the older neighborhoods where blacks were confined, overcrowding was horrible, with single apartments housing multiple families. 
With a captive market, landlords felt no incentive to upkeep their properties, so most of these apartments had broken windows, damaged pipes, overflowed outhouses or plumbing that didn't work, rotting floorboards, leaky ceilings, walls that were so old or poorly constructed that they couldn't even keep out the wind. In addition, these neighborhoods usually lacked access to hospitals or pharmacies. In short, blacks lived in overcrowded, unsanitary neighborhoods without any access to basic medical services. In the black bottom of Detroit, African Americans died from pneumonia at two times the rate and of tuberculosis at three times the rate that whites died from these illnesses. On top of all this, they had to pay more for all these delightful amenities because they weren't allowed to live anywhere else. In Miami, for instance, it costs more money for a black person to rent a one-bedroom apartment than for a white person to rent a hotel room. If somehow a black person found a white person willing to sell him a home and could finance it some way, he might still have to deal with so-called improvement associations, organizations of middle-class and working-class whites who deployed intimidation, harassment, and violence to keep blacks out of their neighborhoods. When one of the foremost black doctors in Detroit, Alexander Turner, tried to move into a beautiful home in an all-white area of Detroit's west side in the summer of 1925, a white mob attacked, smashed the windows of the house, ripped out the phone line, tore tiles from the roof, and ultimately forced Dr. Alexander to sign over the deed of the house to the Neighborhood Improvement Society. Related to this issue of race is the issue of religious practice. Winthrop only respects Christianity. Though he declares freedom of worship, he accepts from that those who are atheist, agnostic, or who practice black magic, whatever that means, and Judaism. So it is like you can practice anything you want, as long as it is Christianity. What about the man himself? What is Buzz Winthrop like, and what makes him so appealing? The narrator describes him as a professional common man who is every prejudice of ordinary Americans. There is nothing about him that is elegant or eloquent. Buzz Windrup is the kind of man who believed in the superiority of anyone who possessed a million dollars. Oh, isn't that nice? Why is Howard Schultz on every television station in this country? Why are you quoting Howard Schultz? Because he's a billionaire. The narrator states that Windrup was vulgar, almost illiterate, a public liar easily detected, and in his ideas almost idiotic. Certainly there was nothing exhilarating in the actual words of his speeches. Winthrop has an earthy sense of humor, yet he is extremely sensitive. He doesn't try to appeal to the best in people, to the better angels of their nature. He appeals to prejudices and hates, to fears and dark thoughts. And he's cruel and pugnacious. Yet, his appeal lies in his very vulgarity and commonness. Because the common man sees him as one of their own, elevated to the highest place in the land. Lewis writes that Winthrop was the common man 20 times magnified by his oratory, so that while the other commoners could understand his every purpose, which was exactly the same as their own, they saw him towering among them, and they raised hands to him in worship. I think the appeal of a millionaire or billionaire president who is vulgar and stupid speaks to the very nature of a heavily class stratified society, with deeply inscribed myths of mobility, opportunity, and meritocracy. In a country which calls itself the land of opportunity, where presumably anybody regardless of their background, can make it, there's something almost shameful about not being financially successful. Americans are peculiarly obsessed with what a man does for a living. Almost invariably, when you meet someone new, you will ask or be asked what they do for a living. And the reality is, not everyone can be president, can be billionaire, can even be a professional. As Sinclair Lewis says through his narrator, even during prosperous times, millions of American families lived on less than $500 a year, which was only enough money to afford one dirty little room for four people and only have 18 cents left over per day to feed each person. These weren't the unemployed or those on relief, but the guys who had the honor of still doing honest labor. As one character in the novel says, to see your own kids living on 18 cents a day for grub, I guess that would make a man pretty extremist. The 1920s, the decade which preceded the Great Depression, was paradoxical. A decade of genuine economic growth and prosperity, rightfully called the Roaring Twenties, but also a decade of enormous poverty and inequality. For whites, the poor but especially what we might call the precarious middle class, i.e. those workers who had achieved middle class status but who could easily lose it due to broader economic distress, Winthrop offers economic and social security. Not the program. He will prevent minorities from taking their jobs, and by inscribing into law the social inferiority of non-whites, he ensures they cannot fall in social status as well because they are white. For working class and unemployed men, many of whom join his League of Forgotten Men, there is the promise of being essential fighters for the nation. In his plank, Windrup states that, It shall be emphasized that the League of Forgotten Men is the chief bulwark against the menace of destructive and un-American radicalism. The League of Forgotten Men were his most loyal followers who had been scorned and thought of as lower classes, as no good. 
So poor and marginalized whites go from being superfluous and scorn to being those most responsible for protecting the nation. We see echoes of this in the fire bombings of 77 family planning abortion clinics in the 80s, carried out mostly by young white men who, in the words of the president of the Right to Life Committee, wanted to defend the right of a husband to protect the life of the child he has fathered in his wife's womb. We see this in the expansion of white militias, in men's rights movements, and in anti-PC movements. The notion of a League of Forgotten Men also harkens to a long American tradition whereby capitalists and their demagogues wield racism to divide the working class. During Reconstruction, Northern capitalists and Southern capitalists, i.e. plantation owners, united in anti-corruption crusades to portray the problems created by capitalism, the extremely corrupted governments and enormous wealth inequality, as really problems of racial inferiors having too much political power of Irish voting and political machines in the North, and of blacks supporting wasteful carpetbagger and scalawag governments in the South. And this worked. In the North, the working class divided along craft and skill lines, which were delineated by race, with Western Europeans doing skilled work and Catholic immigrants being relegated to low skill work. In the South, poor whites sided with large landowners to create the regime of Jim Crow, even as black voters brought universal public education and suffrage to the South. And why did poor Southern whites side with rich whites instead of their fellow working class brethren? I think W.E.B. Du Bois sums it up nicely in his magisterial work, Black Reconstruction America. He writes that, It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and tides of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks, and the courts, dependent upon their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. Their vote selected public officials. The newspapers specialized on news that flattered the poor whites and almost utterly ignored the Negro except in crime and ridicule. The result of this was that the wages of both classes could be kept low. The whites fearing to be supplanted by Negro labor, the Negroes always being threatened by substitution of white labor, white labor saw in every advance of Negroes a threat to their racial prerogatives. Thus, every problem of labor advance in the South was skillfully turned by demagogues into a manner of interracial jealousy. Windrip will also appeal to the ignorances and suspicions of the common man. He uses outrageous figures and facts, which are obviously incorrect, but it is in their incorrectness that makes him seem to be revealing harsh and evil truths hidden away by the elites. Winship scorns democracy for being too slow and inefficient, and he celebrates pageantry, spectacle, and strength. He quadruples the state militia and organizes enormous military demonstrations. What is important to understand, however, is that those parallels persist throughout American history. The contemporary moment, in other words, is not aberrant, Although in every election cycle you will be told that this is the most important election of your life, that this time is different, that the fate of the republic hangs in the balance. This kind of apocalyptic electioneering is as old as the United States itself. During the late 18th and early 19th century, Federalists accused Jeffersonians of fostering mob rule that would destroy the revolution by necessitating the rise of a dictator to restore order. Jeffersonians accused Federalists of being monarchical elitists who wanted to destroy the revolution by restoring crown rule. In the 1800 election, a Federalist newspaper claimed that if Thomas Jefferson won, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught in practice. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. So there is a little bit of election hysteria in the cries of fascism. But this doesn't mean that the concerns about fascism are wrong. It is probably the case that the United States continually creeps closer to fascism. But the question is why? According to Sinclair Lewis, it is because even during periods of great prosperity, there is still much poverty. It is because the rich and powerful are so greedy, so hysterically afraid of anything that might even remotely threaten their gargantuan wealth, that they are willing to exploit racism, promote conspiratorial thinking, and ultimately embrace anti-radical, anti-left fascists. It's because the so-called middle classes have been trained to believe that their little bit of material success is due solely to their own virtues of hard work, discipline, and saving, that the poor are deserving of poverty, and that any systemic solutions to poverty is robbery. And it's because in the United States, it is easier to convince poor whites that if not for immigrants and blacks and women and other minorities, they would be more successful. These are systemic and fundamental problems emerging from capitalism. These themes of the interrelation of nativism, racism, and capitalism, and American mythologies, I plan to explore in subsequent videos on the 19th century American West and on the suburbs. Subscribe so you don't miss those videos. Also make sure to like this video and leave a comment. Thank you for watching.